Today we're talking about the Syrian civil war, said no politician in the last three years. Now while we all weren't looking at this conflict, it pretty much resolved itself. Although let me tell you, we as Americans did not come out on top. We're more floating somewhere in the middle of this result. Although talk about an attention getting intro. Now sorry to disappoint that one person who was really hoping to hear me do 10 minutes on how Trump might have drawn on a hurricane map, but the final battle in the Syrian civil war is currently being waged. If you remember, about a year ago, the Syrians, uh, Syrian government said it was going to launch an all-out assault uh, against Idlib province, the last rebel-held province in, in Syria, but it didn't do so. Well, now they did. And things are going really well for Assad, the leader of Syria who's backed by Russia and, more scary for this administration, <gasps> Iran. Today we're talking about what just happened and how we got here, because nobody in America has thought about Syria since Gary Johnson didn't know where Idlib was. And the occasional headline saying, we defeated ISIS. Oh wait, no we didn't. No seriously, this time we did. Eh, don't go flying that mission accomplished banner quite yet. Now before we talk about what just happened, let me give you some background, because without some context this means almost nothing. Now, there are so many places to start this story, but because this is an episode about Assad and not terrorism, I'm going to do something almost unprecedented for a reporter and not focus on the ISIS part of the story? Wow, I must really not care about clicks. Eh, they'll make a few background cameos in the story. Anyways, the year was 2011 and we were in the heat of the Arab Spring. The world's attention now focused on Syria. Will it be the next domino to fall? Even with the brutal crackdown of the regime, demonstrators are on the streets. According to the UN, at least 5,000 have been killed since March. <sighs> we were so young and naive back then. So this is what Syria looked like in 2011. Enjoy that map because that's the last time it'll look like not a Jackson Pollock painting. Now people were protesting in the streets and most reporters seemed to think Assad might go the way of Gaddafi. Unfortunately for everyone, the Syrian army was attacking the protesters. Which brings us to the 2012 map, where the pro-democracy group took up arms in the blue areas and the Kurds in a separate move just kinda looked at the political situation and said, eh, we're not sticking around, let's make Kurdistan. Now this is where you get the infamous Obama red line moment. We have been very clear to the Assad regime, but also to other players on the ground that a red line for us is we start seeing a whole bunch of chemical weapons moving around or being utilized. Uh, that would change my calculus. Ah yes, the famous red line in the sand. We weren't going to get involved unless the Syrian government used chemical weapons against rebel groups. Now unfortunately for rebels, sand isn't a great place to be drawing lines. So when the Assad regime finally used chemical weapons, the waves washed that line right away and America did nothing. The reason for this lack of follow through was because Assad was one of Iran's closest allies. Now that might sound like a great reason for intervention. But when the president announced his plans to attack the Assad regime and then pulled back, it was exactly the period of time when American negotiators were meeting with Iranian negotiators secretly in Oman to get the nuclear deal. Also, remember, it's 2012. Syria isn't a burning tire fire just yet. It's still just in that slight rebellion phase. Throughout the entire Obama administration though, the United States has maintained that Assad must go. Now 2013, and wow, the rebels are really making some serious headway in Syria. Also, hey, looks like Kurdistan expanded quite a bit too. Good job. Maybe they don't need our help. This nation is sick and tired of war. My answer is simple. I will not put American boots on the ground in Syria. I will not pursue an open-ended action like Iraq or Afghanistan. I will not pursue a prolonged air campaign like Libya or Kosovo. Spoiler alert, that did not happen. But a US invasion was still a few years off. 
Now this brings us to 2014 when something crazy happened. ISIS, which stands for the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria, says now it will simply be known as the Islamic State. And it declared all areas it's overtaken in Syria and Iraq to be a caliphate or Islamic State. Yes, enter everyone's least favorite terrorist group. In 2014, ISIS really took over a lot of rebel territory, making that map even more confusing. Hey, I warned you that this image is going to start getting a little overwhelming. Then 2015 happened and well, it was a really good year for ISIS. It looks like they control over half of Syria now. Also, congrats Kurdistan, you're really gaining a lot in the north. Now for those of you listening in podcast form, sorry but I guess you're just going to have to take my word for it. This is also the year when we heard... American boots will soon be on the ground in Syria. President Obama has ordered about 50 U.S. Special Operations troops to northern Syria to aid Kurdish units and others battling the ISIS terror army. That's right, we were going to go to war against the Islamic State and would be fighting alongside the Kurds. Now Obama made it extra clear that, Iran, if you're listening, we're not going to war on behalf of the anti-Assad rebels, we're going to war on the side of the Kurdish people. I couldn't imagine a president wanting to jeopardize our fledgling relationship with that Middle Eastern power. Now this also brought one other change that I'm sure was completely unrelated. Within two days, the Russian parliament voted in favor of deploying military forces in Syria. And just hours later, the Russian air force carried out its first airstrikes. The target, according to Putin, ISIS terrorists. Now this is where things get interesting. Because you now have the Kurds in America, Assad and Russia, those pro-democracy rebels, and ISIS. It's at this point that you start to see the political equivalent of the parents taking over the kids competing science fair projects with the big guns. It was not a good time to be ISIS as overnight you were the center of a proxy war and you could say they were between a rock and a hard place. This brings us to 2016, a period all called the base race. America built bases throughout Syria mostly on Kurdish land. Although, controversially, there was an airfield and a base in rebel territory, specifically the city of Al Tamf, and I'll come back to that later. These bases were used to train rebels to fight ISIS. Now, I want to emphasize that these were for training purposes only. We were fighting with Kurdistan, but training with rebel forces. We also move a bunch more combat troops to the region. It's the largest deployment of US troops to Syria since the nation's civil war began. 250 special forces operators. On the Russian side, they were leasing land for 50 plus years from the Assad government to fight ISIS, of course. This brings us to 2017 and well, it looks like Assad and the Kurds are really taking ISIS territory in a land grab. At this point, the writing was on the wall that ISIS couldn't be the token bad guy for the US and Russia to keep moving troops into Syria. Especially when, by 2018, ISIS was starting to look like a smudge on the map. As some of you may note, there was now a new president in the White House as well in 2018. And America no longer gave a darn what Iran thought. Tonight I ordered a targeted military strike on the airfield in Syria from where the chemical attack was launched. President Trump announcing that for the first time the United States has taken direct military action against the Syrian regime. Forget ISIS, we're bombing Assad. It was also during this period that Russia and Syria were saying, gee, ISIS has been beat. You guys gonna leave now? Heck, they even convinced Trump to do that for a few days. President Trump has ordered the Pentagon to pull all U.S. troops out of Syria. Earlier, he tweeted, quote, We have defeated ISIS in Syria. My only reason for being there during the Trump presidency. That was quietly reversed a few days later. The question now was, what was our new mission in Syria? Or are we just there to get the lay of the land? Now this is where things got really weird and really dangerous. Because you started seeing reports like... There are fears the U.S. could end up in a direct conflict with new adversaries, Russians. 
we drove to the Conoco oil and gas refinery, now a U.S. base. It's the first time reporters have been here since American troops came under attack on this spot last month by 500 fighters, including Russian mercenaries. Now that we didn't have a common enemy, it was starting to turn into a recipe for World War III. Of course, on the other side, you'd see reports like... U.S. and Kurdish forces attack a Syrian government base in the oil-rich region of Deir Azor in Syria. Russian media say an unknown number of private Russian military contractors were killed, possibly up to 200. U.S. officials estimate the death toll at around 100, with up to 300 injured. Whew, what a bad situation. Yes, a second set of battles was starting between Team America with the Kurds and Team Russia with Assad. All while you still have freedom fighting rebels and pockets of ISIS. Although at this point, ISIS must have been feeling a little overlooked in all of this. It really didn't look like a good situation. Which brings us to today. It looks as though the civil war is on its last leg as Bashar al-Assad, with the support of Russians and Iranians, has successfully bombed and gassed his way into staying in power. The last pro-democracy rebel groups are making a final stand in Idlib. But it looks like this might be the actual final, final stand. This means that the revolution has failed. This of course is only a resolution of the Syrian civil war. Let's bring up the most recent map I could find. While the final fight of the civil war is going on in Idlib, there are still some questions about what's going to happen to Kurdistan and of course the conspicuously still rebel area that is the United States Army base in Al Tanf. We don't seem too excited to leave. The U.S. has established a protective circle around the base that's called a deconfliction zone. Basically, it means cross into that circle uninvited and you risk an American attack. But the pro-regime forces advance anyway, the American strike, saying it's in self-defense. Then the Americans drop leaflets, warning the oncoming forces to stay away from the deconfliction zone. Yeah, we're not going anywhere. So while Assad may now control Syria, we're going to hold on to that 70 mile wide circle of land. About 200 troops will remain in the Syrian town of Al Tanf near the border with Iraq. Their mission is to counter Iran and support US forces in Iraq. So we're not even going to pretend this is ISIS related anymore. Okay, now you might be asking, how does a base in the far corner of nowhere Syria counter Iran? Well, it just so happens that Al Tanf sits on a major highway connecting Syria and Iraq. So until Syria decides to have an infrastructure week and build another connecting highway 35 miles away from our base, we're probably going to stick around. The view from Washington is that Iran's strategic goal is to establish an east-west land corridor stretching from Iran to Lebanon. This would serve as an Iranian arms supply channel to Hezbollah. Control of Al-Tanf would facilitate this objective. Now, in a not at all alarming addition, Iranian and Iran-backed forces are deployed in close proximity to that Al-Tanf desert outpost. Remember though, Iran is allied with Assad, so these foreign troops aren't hostile to the government that is about to win the civil war. Syria has turned into a who's who of foreign troops recently. It seems as though, in the non-Kurdish half of Syria, America has largely resigned itself to, Assad, you can have it, except for this one part of this one road. Now to the other issue we mentioned. Now that the civil war is over, what's going to happen to the half of the country that considers itself to be the independent country of Kurdistan? President Recep Tayyip Erdogan has been pushing to get Syria's Kurds away from the border. He has now gotten the U.S. to help him through the creation of a so-called safe zone. That might seem odd, considering that this is the United States and Turkey arguing over the fate of the Kurds in former, or maybe current depending on who you ask, Syria. Now, Turkey is partially worried because, well, this is the land claimed by Kurds overlaid on the current borders circa the start of the Syrian civil war. And wow, a lot of that land is in Turkey. Now, Turkey can currently suppress their own Kurdish independence movements, but so could Syria until the civil war broke out. Basically, Turkey's goal is to get all of this talk of Kurdish independence movements away from their border. 
Conveniently enough, this plan seems to be working out pretty well for everybody. Kurdish authorities in northeastern Syria say their forces have started to withdraw from outposts along the Turkish border after the United States and Turkey reached a deal to establish a safe zone there earlier this month. Amongst the entirety of Kurdistan's and Turkey's shared border, the first 5 kilometers will be open to being patrolled by Turkey, and further in, patrolled by the United States, and then further further in, being patrolled by the United States and the Kurds. It would kind of look like this, although the specifics of the measurements have changed since the artist rendered that image. So there you have it. This might be what Syria looks like in a few months time, except without that rebellious portion in Idlib. The question people are asking now is, how is this country going to be rebuilt? And yeah, that's an episode for another day. Thank you and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube! If you want to support independent, nonpartisan news, remember to subscribe by clicking on this floating logo to the right of my head. Ring that bell so that freedom will continue to ring and give me a thumbs up if you like what you saw. Lastly, as always, thank you for watching.